All right, my local recording is running as soon as we start the webinar, the uh, cloud recording will start. So Erica, why don't you uh, mute, so down at the bottom of your um, Zoom page, you can see mute and stop video. And then Liz will call you back on. I am going to go away first video. And then um, we are at 2.59. Uh, so Liz, I will uh, mute. Oh, we are at three, so I'm going to mute and then uh, and then give me five seconds. I will start the webinar. Welcome, everyone. I'm Liz Taylor, ocean explorer, naturalist, and entrepreneur. I'm Sylvia Earle. I'm an ocean elder, National Geographic explorer at large founder of Mission Blue. <laughs> this is our show Dive In, where we host informal and open conversations with the ocean community on topics of wonder and interest. I am going to attempt to do something of wonder and interest and share the screen. <laughs> Always an adventure. It, it, it truly is. And, oh share no we're on a share we just need to get this oh my goodness <laughs> i'm so sorry everyone we just want this to pull over here we go at last uh -huh. yay <laughs> always a little technical challenge at times so as we uh, get going on through today, we can uh, ask questions by writing them in the Q&A box, and we'll answer as many as we can towards the end of the program. Uh, throughout the conversation today, you will see uh, links and um, notes being added to the chat box there for your reference. And before we really get underway, I we want to remind everyone that the world is blue. blue. Yes. <laughs> where the action is. Today we're going to be joined by Erica Hilton, a multimedia uh, artist, curator, and president of the Asmus Contemporary. It's a gallery that supports artists and conservationists working for positive global change. Erica, could you turn on your um, camera and microphone and join us? There she is. There she is. Hey, how are you? I think you still have to unmute. <laughs> there, there you go. go yay hey hi Liz. hi sylvia it's so nice to be here thank you so much for having me thank you for joining us um we met erica at a diving trade show uh, following her participation in the elysium uh, coral triangle project and she was actually supposed to meet sylvia on that trip but um broke my heart i could not go at the go last moment <laughs> i've been i've been in that region which is one of the reasons that i so wanted to go again well such it broke mine region. too yeah <laughs> it is such an amazing part of the planet the diversity of life you would think rainforests are diverse but oh dive into these waters and you'll see a cross-section of life on earth some strange and wonderful creatures that occur nowhere on the land, but so magnificent forests of coral and of life. Just, but they're also, huh, sadly, part of the Elysium expeditions, and there have been three of them so far, but part of the assignment is to not only look at life, but also look at the problems. This is another part of the ocean, a part of the Pacific Ocean, where you, you don't expect to find trash. 300 miles offshore from the coast of Costa Rica around Cocos Islands uh, on another expedition found just an avalanche of plastic. And then we've all, you know, I think is, you know, certainly all of us have been witness to this. And, you know, one of our biggest pet peeves are yeah. these little beauties, right? Yeah. Every time you go someplace, a little island, Coastal place, you get yeah. what are these the horrible little sample things? Single that, use, single yeah, use that show once. up in your hotel room or all around you, and you're just kind of deluged with them. And cups, and the, the fact is that most of these island nations just don't have 
capacity to deal with it or how do how do you deal with it and so the fish have to deal with it they also have to deal with fishing nets and lines that are probably the bulk of plastic but you know everyone can be a part of solving this problem with the actions they take so erica you during your coral triangle um expeditions you've Found, I'm going to go through some of these um, little bits and pieces that you've that you collected. Is this is this all kind of typical of the kind of plastic that you were encountering while you were there? Was um, everything out there? Down there? Yeah, and and some of it had come from ten thousand miles away. It wasn't just local plastic that we found. Um, you know, they'd come from the Americas. They'd come from all over. But and, uh, there were just little pieces there, and then we found a lot of microplastics as well. And even nanoplastics and and you know micro turns to nano <laughs> <laughs> and fishing gear too. That always tends to be a. We found a, yes, we found fishing nets. We found we found a lot of things down there. I mean, it was it was very sad. I mean, this place is supposed to be one of the most pristine paradises on earth, and here we are. You know, you were talking about the pet peeves of the little little. Um, shampoos and all of those yeah. mine is going into a restaurant and sitting down ordering a glass of water and having them put a straw in the water glass right <laughs> like, why do i need why do i need a straw i can drink yeah, the can glass. Ask, yeah yeah you can drink the water i mean but yeah most people can just use their lips so yeah. <laughs> and you know it's not even good for you those straws they make lines on your lips yeah like smoke yeah. lines you know that's wrinkles that's yeah gross. Maybe that'll help them to stop <laughs> drinking with straws. But what inspired you to, to begin putting these kind of found objects into your works of art? Um, well, I've, I've always loved the oceans, the seas. I was born on the Mediterranean coast of Turkey. My gra I was born in my grandmother's house and um, her house was maybe a thousand feet from the Mediterranean. So until I was six years old, I grew up on the Mediterranean. And then we came to America and um, one of my favorite drinks of choice is water. And ah. I, I can tell you the difference between all the bottled waters, um, you know, between, with, with all the different minerals from each one, whether it's spring water, whether, whatever it is. And so my husband, who's from Germany said to me one day, you know, you're a really bad person. You're drinking bottled water and you're, you're destroying the planet. We in Germany, we recycle. And I'm like, okay, fine. I'm going to save my bottles now and I'm going to have them recycled and I'm going to do an art project with it. And that's how it started. So I saved up these giant garbage bags full of bottled water that I had consumed. And it took me forever in Chicago to find a recycling company. I called the city of Chicago. They wouldn't give me the name of anyone. Wow. So strange. Finally, I was very nice and convinced someone to give me, oh, I, I, um, I saw Lakeshore recycling truck, a big garbage truck. And I chased it down and took a picture <laughs> of the name and the phone number. And I called them. And then they said, well, we don't really recycle. We just pick it up. And um, finally, the manager gave me the name of a company where they um, started recycling and the guy laughed at me. And he <laughs> said, you know, you really don't have to bring these trash bags full. We have millions and millions of pounds of plastic. We can give you anything you want. You wanna do an art project? No problem. Wow. Yeah, it was sad. Yeah. So that and, was in Missoul. Yeah. And and then and then this led you to, to doing kind of wild and crazy things like painting underwater. So how did you pull this off? <laughs> All right. I, I think I drove Michael out crazy because we were in Missoul and we were only at like nine meters. It wasn't that that uh, deep. But um, there was a very big current and they were taking pictures. Here, here. Really nice. <laughs> And I had, oh, there's a giant sea turtle behind me. I don't know if you see yeah, that. There. Yeah, yeah. Isn't that gorgeous? <laughs> so um, I had all my equipment on and I'm like, wait, no one's going to know it's me. So I started taking everything off and <sighs> took off my mask, everything. 
And they were going crazy, going, you can't do that. And I'm like, yes, I can. I, you know, I'm a swimmer. And I used to do triathlons years ago. And I love being underwater. And so they did keep the, the regulator, you know, whenever I needed it. It was they, fine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, they were. Right. breathing, yeah. You know, they kept me alive. But, um, and, and, and the paint didn't stick because I was using water-soluble paints. So <laughs> it just sort of becomes like, um, you know, sand, basically. But I didn't want to use oil down there because I no. didn't want to damage, you know, do any more damage than, than I could. So actually that picture was taken um, by Tyler Wang. I don't know if you know Tyler. And um, he made me look so good. I, I didn't <laughs> look that good. You know, when you're in the water, you're yeah. like a wet rat coming out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but um, that was just something that, that um, I just wanted to try it and see if yeah. it was possible. And, and um, I was very fortunate that, that he was able to capture the photograph. Yeah, that's great. But this is, you know, this is more of what we normally are seeing. It's, you know, you get in these places, beautiful places, and oftentimes that beautiful water is completely obliterated um, with plastic just kind of sitting on the surface or in the creek beds. And it's just, it's just everywhere. Yeah, where's the water? It's overwhelming, you know, it's like, where is the water in all of this? <laughs> Erica, I'm not sure I was off. talking about. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Sylvia. Um, this was the beach at Ambon when we um, boarded the boat. Yes, yeah. that's what I was going to say. But just as you got off the boat, this is what you, yes. <laughs> what you encountered. Right. It's just, yeah. I mean, it, and it, it really is interesting to to dissect this in a way to, to kind of understand like where do these pieces come from, and to be able to trace them back to their, you know, to their origin. Return to sender. Yeah, it's, <laughs> I mean, there are some projects that are that are doing that, and like the Literati um, project where you can take pictures of of trash and, and plastic in particular that you encounter and and post it so that you know there's some hope of um, spurring some corporate uh, consciousness yeah there's a move to try to get fishing gear marked so that when it is lost you can identify where did it come from lost or tossed sometimes seems more convenient to let fishing gear just go back into the ocean rather than retrieving it because these plastic materials, one of their attractive features is they're relatively inexpensive. And so it's convenient to just let them go, whether it's a fishing net or a line or a plastic cup or bottle or whatever. I have a friend in Istanbul um, who creates sculptures from all the different colored um, fishing nets. Mm. that are really beautiful. She collects them wherever she finds them and um, she creates these beautiful sculptures. Um, but but the, the idea is to make the art look beautiful, but it's a message. Right. Yeah. It's trying to bring up the, the conversation, which is what we're doing right now. I mean, it's, right. it's not just, oh, I found a really cool uh, material to do a piece of art with. It's not about that. It's right. about communication. It's about bringing the message and trying to uh, make people understand what it is that that material right. really is. You know, it's oil. It's not, it's not just a pretty clear piece of plastic. It's made of something that is detrimental to our oceans and our lives. Right. It's an oil spill. It is. It's an oil spill of a different kind. It really is. You know, the one, the one thing that when you're looking at this image, you know, every single piece of plastic in this image arrived there through a series of human hands mm. from and you know by the one hopeful story is that by um by that same methodology it can be removed um but just piece by piece and bit by bit we just have to get on and do the work i i agree i mean it's it's something that um we can do it because human beings are capable of anything <laughs> Like right? what you were saying, Sylvia, if people can go to the moon, then we can go below the ocean, you know, seven miles. And we can, we can map out um, the oceans. Uh, you know, that, that really hit me when you were talking about that. We don't have a GPS system for the oceans. You know, I can't like open up my iPhone if I'm diving somewhere and I get lost. I'm not going to know where to go. <laughs> have to go back to the boat. 
just that can connect with the GPS. <laughs> right. If I, if I don't go all, that far. All <laughs> That's all you can do. <laughs> yeah. I was chasing a manta when we were in Raja Ampat. And um, it was the first manta I had ever seen. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm in love. And I'm just, you know, swimming along. And uh, all of a sudden I turned around and I'm like, ooh, I think I went too far. And, um, and, and I didn't do thousands of dives like everyone else on the boat. I was the newbie on the boat. Um, you know, I was the artist on board. I wasn't the professional diver who's logged a thousand hours. Um, so it was hard for me and I, I happened to get seasick very easily. And so it was doubly hard for me, but I love being underwater so much. Of course, yeah. when you're underwater, you don't get seasick. So I just Great. always get off the boat. And your, your, I flow like water series is where you really messaging about some of these, um, plastics that you encountered and, and incorporating them in the pieces. So we've got a yeah, few transforming of them Transforming ugly into art. <laughs> they now, really are beautiful. So that it's something that people will want to collect and mm -hmm. to have. Um, this one actually, um, Sylvia, when we were in China, and that's a terrible picture of it, unfortunately. I didn't have a good picture to send you. Um, <laughs> but when we were in China, this was one of the paintings that was in the exhibition, and it's called Heart of the Ocean. And so this was specifically painted for the um, Elysium um, exhibition. Well, you made it beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This one's one of my favorites. It's called Tides. And uh, this one is about the interconnection with everything in the universe, from the oceans to the stars. And my work, I, I did... When I first began painting, I did a series on nebulas, you know, where mm. stars are born and realized that all of the elements that are in our bloodstream are the same elements that are um, in a star. And we're yeah, all stardust. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> and so this sort of is like the stairway, you know, the, to heaven, basically. Um, but I didn't mean it that. It's called Tides because that was the name of my last show that I did. Um, at Brushwood Center, which is um, a wonderful art center where they um, focus on conservation. And um, see, the year before I had my show, Robert Redford and his wife, Billy Chigars Redford, did a, a show there called The Way of the Rain. And, you know, of course, they are completely immersed in conservation of, in our environment. Yeah. So, yeah, no. those are little pieces of plastic on there. Yeah, it just really adds that, you know, feel and texture and everything to the to the painting and then to have it to have it with that such an important message as well. Right. Yeah. Ugly and the beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> this one actually is one of my favorite pieces. I think it was the, the fastest painting I ever did, like an action painting. And um, okay. <laughs> I used only two colors. And the two colors I used were sapphire blue and um, a sage green. And the blue and the green turned out like this. And it's called crescendo. It was it was just like- How large is it? Yeah. yeah. It's, um, it? I think like 18 by 24. It's not a large painting. It's yeah. full of energy. But you yeah. can dive into it. Yeah, you definitely. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so beautiful. Thank you, thank you. And that again is the tides painting galaxy and that's the other one where this time the ocean is on top it's it's the inverse mm -hmm. and um when um it came from my multiverse series and um i was in paris for um an art fair and a friend of mine had joined me and she and i decided we were going to take the eurostar across to london from paris so um a friend of mine is one of the um She's the, the prima ballerina for the Royal Ballet. And she invited us to come and watch them as they did a rehearsal. The rehearsal was for a modern ballet called Multiverse. And oh. it was really beautiful, it was great. And then that evening we went back because we were only going to, Paris, uh, to London for the day. We get to the train station, we couldn't find the train. Um, oh. They had no signs. 
And Been there. Yeah. Um, so we, we ended up missing our train back to Paris. So we decided until the next train, which was five o'clock in the morning, we were going to go to a movie. So we go to the theater and um, there was Benedict Cumberbatch in Doctor Strange. The movie was about multiverses. How cool is that? I mean, it was first, <laughs> exactly. It was like, first we go and see this ballet and it's called multiverse. And now we're seeing Doctor Strange and it's about the multiverses. And so this painting was inspired by Doctor Strange and his multiverse. <laughs> No, but it's, and not, it's about the ocean yeah. and you know water and <laughs> what does that have to it you know, it's a strange night in paris a strange night in paris but it's <laughs> it's really wonderful to see you know because it does have you know real depth to it and and you're seeing the as we see that most of the most of the ocean is actually dark but it's but it's illuminated by these millions of, of tiny organisms and the lights that they provide correct so yeah. it's really a, a yeah, Beautiful. thank you. <laughs> but you know, in in this whole thing of with the ocean plastics, you know, the real the real deal is, you know, as we work and strive to get them out of the environment, we've just got to stop making more. <laughs> and you know, I wanted to to make sure that everyone was aware of this situation that's happening right now in Sri Lanka. And you know, this is the this is the container ship, the Express Pearl of all things. Um, and it caught fire on May the 20th and it was smoldering away and it sent out um, you know, a call to come into port and it was denied entrance into, into a port where it could have received help. And instead it was kind of, um, they were left to kind of fend for themselves in a way and the entire ship caught fire and it was carrying a cargo of pretty much hazardous materials of various kinds, including, um, 25 metric tons of nitric acid. So the, you know, the leaking containers of nitric acid eventually led to an explosion and a major fire. And the only kind of the only upside is that 25 um, seafarers on board were able to, to uh, escape without being killed. Um, but also on board were numerous containers of the plastic nurdles, which go into making new plastics. It's just little tiny bits of raw material. And here they here the you know Coast Guard valiantly trying to um, extinguish the fire so they could, you know, they were really trying hard to to tow this thing um, into any port they could after the fact when they were after they were denied entry to begin with. Um, but this is the aftermath. These are all plastic nurdles. Looks just like snow. It looks like, you know, these guys are talking about this looks like snowdrifts exactly um, on the beach. And they just they're, they're all struggling to try to clean this stuff up. And I mean, after the fact, yeah. after the fact, and, and this is, you know, these are pristine beaches, you know, just off the coast, these offshore little, of Colombo. These little nurdles are around the world in beach sand, sometimes more nurdles and sands of grain, because this is not the only time that a, a cargo of these raw materials that turn into little plastic toys, toothbrushes, these little plastic bottles, it's the raw material. Again, gets reborn in thousands of different ways. And spoons, cups, it's just... Even the, it, even, even the gloves and boots these guys are wearing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's probably just, get recycled and I'm not recycled, but <laughs> yeah, goes back into the ocean. Yeah. Well, what is it? It takes 500 to a thousand years for um, plastic to disintegrate, but does it really? It doesn't really. No, it, it just gets smaller and smaller and eventually consumed by like those little shrimp that we saw earlier and, right. and other microorganisms. To nanoplast, right down to the molecular level, these synthetic materials keep their integrity. They stay as plastic. Even when you can't see them, they're still in the air we breathe, the water we drink, and certainly out in the ocean as a part of an enduring part of the 21st century it just amazes me i mean i i you know when when we talk about this with people they don't know I yeah think 
kids, they're, they're just not educated about it. They're like, oh, just one, you know, one bottle or one, one straw or one. Yeah, spoon, what does it matter? You know, container. you know, uh, it's not going to do anything. Yes, it is. But and this so much is invested in catching wildlife with plastic nets and lines and other gear that are still out there. You know, nets that were discarded back in the 1960s as ghost nets are still there mm -hmm. killing things. We, we see it oftentimes when we we're called in to, to do, a, you know, an environmental survey of an old wreck to see if it's leaking oil or whatever it's doing. And, and so frequently you'll see that the entire ship wreck is covered in like, in like net, spider webs, like spider webs, and it just keeps killing um, the marine life that uh, ventures near it. It's the real cost of fish on the menu is what's out there still. I mean, looking, looking at your film Mission Blue, you know, with the... Um the percentage of fish, the, the large fish especially, that's left in the ocean. I mean, it's frightening. We're too yeah. good at catching them. We really are. <laughs> and not good enough about looking at the consequences of how we catch them. Mm. I mean, fish don't stand a chance anymore. We, we, or we become, you know, these are not these handmade nets that they are made that, of hemp or yeah, something jute that or something degrades. like that that degrades. And, mm. and have only taken a small number of animals out of the ocean, mostly to really be consumed instead of turned into products of various sorts with this, now this huge bycatch. It, it's just, it, it's, if people really understood, this is not the old school type of fishing a thousand years ago or a hundred years ago, or even 50 years ago. It's the large scale extraction of wildlife using technologies that didn't exist when I was a kid and materials that didn't exist when I was a kid either. I mean, including nurdles. These nurdles, I mean. The, nurdles, just, I mean, <laughs> what a word. I know, right? It's, it's like word. who came up with it just when I was a kid. Yeah, if you go back and look at an old dictionary, there's no such word. <laughs> but, no, no. But, uh, but this is, I mean, this just shows you how uh, pervasive it is in the environment. I mean, this is just the wave of it coming on shore. Well, you know, a friend of mine is a, a biochemist, and um, during the um, Exxon oil spill, uh, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, she was down there, and she actually um, invented a solution that will um, disintegrate the oil and turn it into food for marine life. Hmm. So that's really great. I don't understand why so many of these companies are not using her product. It's called Echo BioClean, by the way, that's the name of it. Oh. And we talked about if she can do that, create a solution that's going to disintegrate oil, why can't we create a solution that's going to disintegrate plastic and turn it into food? Mm -hmm. Well, that some of these organic that, that won't hurt the animals. And so she right. said that it's, it's, you know, the research is going to cost millions of dollars and doing all the efficacy trials. And um, so I, I think it's something we have to really consider. Unlike the dispersants that do not actually degrade the oil, they break it up into smaller and smaller pieces. They accelerate the, the degradation, but they don't actually change its nature. Right. Mm -hmm. it, it actually tends to spread it further because it can't be collected once it's dispersed. <laughs> it just it tends to persist in the environment. Um, but it's as it micro or nanoplastics. But it's it really is the true cost of the um, of the, the plastic that we just kind of take for granted so often. And um, it, and it's just really pervasive in in our daily lives and mm -hmm. and increasingly in, know, in us we're, in we're, us, we're yeah. becoming plasticized <laughs> well, we're we really are plastic every day i think i i know that um you know in our sea salt in in the fish that we eat i mean every time i do eat fish i don't eat it very often anymore because i feel so guilty um, up. <laughs> i know i actually am i'm i'm basically there I'm basically yeah. there. Um, you know, I, I mean, I stopped eating meat when I, I learned about um, factory farming. And so I, I think that, and I but love fish vegetables. Meat. Fish are meat too. Just ask any fish. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> what am I? I'm not made out of... No, no, you know. it's, it's very true. And um, all right. So as of today, I'm going to <laughs> take the pledge. Take the pledge. Taking the pledge. That's it. No more fish.
that little, you. that little crab will be very grateful. Yeah. yeah. But you look at the little guy and, you know, these guys, they, they, this is one of these little ghost crabs and they kind of make their, their livelihood there in the, in the beach sand. Yeah, where's the sand? And he's, he's kind of like, wait, I can't get to the sand. There's a little patch of sand to the one side, but I'm, I'm surrounded by nerds. Yeah. The nurdles and, and by the <laughs> way those are not easy to create art with i have to tell you the little flakes are easier i've tried I've the nurdles. It. forget it no nurdles yeah no nurdles but no. but but you really do have to think of like how are they going to get these out of the environment it's once they're there, you know, once they're, they're there they're called mermaids tears mm -hmm. wow kids give have given them that name and interestingly i saw uh, a story about some of these nurdles actually showing up in um oysters where a woman you know, in a restaurant, she she was very surprised, you know, opened the oyster and she found that it had like, you know, like, I don't know, a dozen pearls or more inside this one oyster. And they're like, how can this happen? They're not pearls. But, well, they're mermaid tears. But they, they were, like they were pearls, but they had, everyone had formed around a, a nurdle mm -hmm. um, that had been out oh, in the environment. And, right. An irritant. An irritant. Okay. So instead of a grain of sand, they started with this little seed of plastic. As an irritant that created, you know, this uh, this yeah. pearl formation, <laughs> just this kind of bizarre. Nature trying to heal. It's amazing what we've done to ourselves, to our our children, to people. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, to our to our progeny. Yeah, and we were having a we had a conversation. I guess it was yesterday yeah. on Clubhouse. Was it yesterday on Clubhouse? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and we were we talked with. Um, in a multi-generational clubhouse and and with um, your son yeah my grandson yeah the artist the artist Another, a fellow artist other fellow Taylor. artists yeah. yeah also working with some plastic and derelict fishing gear and art but um you know it was kind of this this conversation about how uh some of the older generation is very set on their ways or i'm going to use plastic and i love my plastic bag or whatever but they're they're increasingly learning from the kids coming up who are having to deal with the with the uh, Anthropocene and the and the fallout from it, and are having going to have to be dealing with um, this kind of pervasive plastic in the environment mm -hmm. and the the real fallout from uh, climate change. We'd and, like to think that children learn from their elders, and of course, to some extent, they do. That's how civilization progresses. You learn something, you pass it along, but now the kids are working in the other direction they're teaching the elders they are Pretty exciting they are i love it when i when i to, to your point earlier and you go to a restaurant and somebody brings you the straw and the glass of water and i've seen some kids just like rise completely up. rise up from the table and like <laughs> throw the straw and like, <laughs> <laughs> there's a there's a cafe next door to my gallery and um she she's wonderful has has you know great food great drinks and I, I um, went over there one day, I ordered some juice and said to her, I don't want a straw because she puts a straw on everything. And I said, you know, maybe if you use paper straws or something else that um, <clears throat> isn't what plastic, <clears throat> excuse me. I said, um, I, I think it might be nice. I think your, your clients would love it. She said, no, 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 no. I'll lose all my business if I don't give the plastic straws to my clients because the paper will, will, um, you know, it, it, it wilts, it, it, it gets soft. And I said, I know, but there's so many other types, you know, bamboo, something you can use. And I said, it would be good. And she, she, and I, I, I was very nice about it. I mean, I wasn't, oh, sure. I, said, Look, I will buy <laughs> biodegradable straws. I will buy a case for you. Just try it. And she wasn't happy. So I, I was like, okay, I'm sorry. I, I, really think it would be good and I will send out I will help promote you being environmentally conscious and so she she was like I don't care so then the clubhouse where we we live um I know the owners of the clubhouse and they were they were giving the carry out containers and plastic and I had a similar talk you know maybe you could do something biodegradable and and you know it would be good for you and the environment three weeks later i ordered food and they had those really nice compostable containers and nice. i was like, yes thank you so much and um they were like yeah you know what we didn't realize it and so you know it just takes a conversation 
It really does. And, Mm -hmm. and, you know, being, being that source of inspiration and leading by example. Mm -hmm. So, and then, you know, having that, uh, that multiplier effect that, you know, you're happy about it. You tell other people about it, they get more business. It's, it's that kind of positive feedback that, that can really. And um, I find my grandkids teaching me all the time. That's right. (laughs) Isn't that wonderful? (laughs) Oh, I do want to add um, after we had that conversation, this was a couple years ago, quite a few cafes opened up in our neighborhood and they're all run by young kids and they're all very environmentally conscious. That's and awesome. It's, it's so, a move. you know what? I think she's now beginning beginning to be a little bit more. Uh, yeah, someday she'll think she thought of it. That's I, right. <laughs> it's economic too, you know? Yeah, it's yeah, definitely. So another, I wanted to see here. Oh, we're going to show this picture too. That's where the baby crabs are, <laughs> and the young fish. You know, typically when you see this in a healthy ocean, you say, yes, these are, this is a nursery. These are all the little stages of so many forms of life that are out there. Increasingly, however, you know, the they proportion. have to compete in, for space from the tiny little bits of plastic that are out there. Mm-hmm. So it isn't just what you see on the beach. It's out there in the wild suspended. ocean as well. Yeah, suspended yeah. all the way down to the bottom. Well, it's it, so easy to see how um, ocean wildlife that that eats plankton, you know, yeah. you think about things like whale sharks or they just baleen whales, them. mantas, oysters, you know, oysters, oh. uh, all the shellfish that, that you know, um, filter feed, any of those big animals, the corals, feed, the corals, the corals, the little coral polyps, they take in normally in a healthy ocean, they would be looking for the the eggs, the larval stages of their fellow creatures, but now they're sucking up bits and pieces of plastic as well. And in some cases, they've actually had the shown the coral are are starving uh, yeah. because the plastic make just like you know the albatross will consume plastic and and feed it to their chicks and they starve to death. Because there's coral no room can, for mm-hmm. no room for real food and again, right. kind of like stuck in there, right? Mm-hmm. So it's a uh, it's just a, things we didn't think about. No, plastics have been regarded as a boon to humankind and and they're pervasive they're in our buttons in our clothing in our you know, shoes but they're, our but they're durable computers. they're yeah. durable uses for them that are actually you know that can be a benefit right. but um but it's a single use business it is just right. really and, appalling and, dis- and discarding things like nets and lines and right. anything that we throw that stays in the sea but we wanted to, to come back to your your work and Thank and you. talk about the the uh, Van Gogh exhibit. So there's been this this immersive Van Gogh uh, that's kind of gone around the country now. But yeah. you were selected as the artist in resident uh, while I was in Chicago. Can you it's tell us more there. about that. I'll be here for a while. Oh, there for a while. <laughs> I'm okay. The inaugural. I'm the inaugural artist in residence. Very good. Yes. Um, and you, but you've incorporated. These are some detail pictures where you've kind of incorporated some of these. They're really well, beautiful. These are these are actually um, photographs that I took underwater in Raja Ampat. These are coral. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, they're coral. I figured Vincent, you know, Van Gogh, he loved nature. He loved flowers. He loved, you know, if, if he was able to be a scuba diver, I'm sure he would have been. And uh, oh, yeah, he would. Wouldn't that be he, cool? He would have painted <laughs> corals instead of irises and sunflowers. <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, these are all... Um, paintings of corals, but of course, with the plastic, because that's what it is. It's pretty. I mean, they look beautiful, but that's a reality. And how, what, what kind of um, uh, reaction did you get from, from people upon realizing that these are created with plastic? Do they, they give you good feedback or? or they do. They... they love it. They think it's really cool. They want to play with the plastic. I have a little. Oh, no. <laughs> And they, they just, you know, they want to run their fingers through it. Um, no, but, but I think it just, they're like, oh, yeah, I didn't realize that. Hmm, interesting. And so, you know, it's just, just a tiny little seed that you plant in their minds. Um, it, it, it really is about that, you know, reaching people who might otherwise never really occur to them that, you know, how does, how does plastic affect a, a coral reef or, you know, how could it possibly? <laughs> how can it affect your body? You know, I mean, every yeah. time you eat something, most of uh, the meats and the, the fish and everything else you're eating is plastic. I mean, you're, you're consuming it. 
when we drink water. I mean, it depends on where you're getting your water. There's, there's probably microplastics in this. Certainly in the bottled, bottled water that um, you know, people buy. Um, and if you put it through your own home uh, filter pitcher, things like that, then, which is usually also made of plastic. But, <laughs> <laughs> but at least there, you know, it's a very durable uh, item that can be recycled at, at life end. Right. I mean, yes, there are good uses for plastic. I mean, from, from the handles on our refrigerators to um, the, the keys on our keyboard, on our laptops. I mean, but these are not, like you said, it's the single use that's the problem yeah. in the world. Right? The throwaway attitude that there is in a way somewhere. Yeah. And during this pandemic, so much material has been created right. for short-term use and then <laughs> long-term problem. Yeah, I mean, everything from masks. The, no, it's masks everywhere. Masks, yeah. gloves, all the, you oh know, God, all these yes. items. Yeah. You know, I, I think it's it's strange. I mean, America is such a clean country, right? You don't see so much litter on the roads like you did, like in other countries. You know, when, when we were going through, um, what's, what's uh, Papua New Guinea? Sarong. Oh, yeah. When we were in Sarong, you know, all the, the, the plastic on the sides of the streets, in the rivers. I mean, I don't know if you saw in my, my um, video that I had, they were burning the plastic and then the rivers were just full, brown. And then you breathe I mean, it. <laughs> yeah. Gorgeous places on earth. It's so remote and it was just filthy with plastic. Yeah. And it's, but a lot of that is again, you know, the, the people that are just shipping the plastic into these into these places, it's like because um, it's really oftentimes it, you know the, the 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 native peoples they don't want that plastic. You know they're happy to to use traditional methods of you know wrapping things in right. in leaves and you know to transport it or to carry food that way. They don't have to have a, a Ziploc bag <laughs> or you know or, or or any kind of plastic really if they it's just they not in there. addicted yeah but just or, becomes you know, and then recycling isn't really the answer i mean what is what is the number the percentage in the united states eight or nine percent of the plastic is recycled and then i was talking to my guy that uh, who now is my supplier of wow. recycled plastics and he said you know it depends on the price of oil if the price of oil is low virgin plastic is cheaper to make than recycling if right. the price of oil is high, then it's worth recycling. It's and so people don't realize that this is going on. I, like I said, it's all economics. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, so we have to show. <laughs> I love it. I want to be in one of these. <laughs> yeah. We, we want we want you to, to go with us in one of these at, at some point, but okay. You know, this, but this is a this is a use of you know responsible acrylic, use of responsible use of acrylic because um, you know, that's what these what the hulls of these submersibles are are uh, are made of. But you know it's a it, when we think about I mean I kind of remember some of the first plastic coming along and you know, you know my grandmother's Tupperware that we still have and still use today. You know it's it's old plastic. It's you know decades it doesn't old. Go away. It doesn't go away, <laughs> but it's still very functional. And and the same with you know, in a, in a use of, of um, acrylic like this, you know, these have a kind of a typical lifespan of at least 20 years in, in service. And then, you know, they, they have can the be, ultimate solid bowl. Yeah, you, but you can, <laughs> but, you know, you can use them for other things. And I'd love to, I'd love one day, you know, to you know, say 20 plus years from now, we'll, we'll get you to incorporate one of these spheres into a, a work of art. <laughs> I will. I will. I just want to go down with you in one of these and just, you yeah. know, the first time that I, I, um, I got my scuba diving uh, certification in Nassau. And then I went to Seba, you know, the, um, in the Caribbean. Ooh. And it was, it was a marine park. And it was the first time that I had seen the colors of the corals and the different colors of fish. And I'm like, oh my God, this is like being in outer space, but with, 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 beautiful colors and and just it was so joyful you, you actually get to see more fish bigger fish greater diversity of all yeah. forms of life if you let if you let just leave them let them be don't yeah. kill them yeah i mean i i i um you know 
if I have to choose between going out into outer space and you know trying to come near a star or going underwater and seeing the life that's you know the civilizations right of, right of, of I mean, it just it, it, it I'm speechless yeah. when I think about the beauty of it the poetry of it and so thank you so much for sharing this Sylvia Liz I can't Thank you enough for um, allowing me to talk about my passion. Well, <laughs> I appreciate it. Having you here and hearing your passion and just to know that you are inspiring people to care. And it, it, everyone has something special about themselves that if they just do as you are doing, use that talent, use that special thing that makes you you to make a difference. Thank you. You know, it's funny. We we talk about um, there. There's always this this struggle. You know, this pull between people who care about the environment and people who care about finance. And mm -hmm. I I I have both right brain, left brain working. I think the two of you um, are are similar. You're very creative in what you do, but you also understand business. And we, we think about, oh my God, it's all politics, which a lot of it is politics. And I thought, you know, I'm so tired of this. I want to start a, a political party that's called the Conscious Capitalist Party, okay. where we, we make money and do the things that need to be done economically to take care of our families, to do whatever it takes, but do it consciously. Right. And do it with taking care of our earth because the more money we put into it, the more money, or the, the, the safer, the better it's going to be if we do the right thing. We also have to account for nature properly. Right. Right now, fish, when they're swimming in the ocean, have an accounting base of zero. They're regarded as free goods. Come on. A dead fish can't be worth more than a live fish, but that's the way, it's only when they're dead that they're valued. Pounds of protein. <laughs> yeah, barrels of oil for, for whales. Now we have, at least we're beginning to look at the real value of life, a living planet versus a dead one. We can start from scratch on Mars, but we have a much better chance of a long and prosperous future if we look at this planet and really understand the value of a living system versus clear cutting the trees so we can plant dead things like roads. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I love, I love the, um, you know, the kind of the new movement towards daylighting uh, creeks that have been paved over and, and just basically deep paving where we can, because every time we're, you know, we're paving the earth, we're smothering the earth and disrupting the water cycle and, mm -hmm. and just creating so many um, problems for ourselves that yeah. if we just account for living planet and the and the real economics of what, it what is your life worth you can have, have an insurance company value of your life <laughs> but there's also the ethics of a planet that works in your favor that we have a home populated with the diversity of life that really makes our existence possible it's just a new appreciation for what you should know from the time you're born that we need this living planet we right. can't just convert everything into a product and still have a planet that works absolutely That's true so um the year before last last year i always forget it's two years ago not last year um <laughs> i was in i was in zurich for um uh astrophysics festival because i'm sort of a, a science nerd myself people don't realize that i i just i love this stuff Art and science so, <laughs> okay so we're 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 gonna go in that submersible together yes and um so so i'm there and there are all these apollo 11 astronauts there and there were all these these scientists who had nobel prize winners all these really cool people and um I'm listening to, and I won't name which Apollo 11 um, uh, astronaut said this, but um, he was one of the first ones to land on the moon. Okay. And he said, okay, so he said, 
in the, the press conference, you know, we really need to colonize, colonize Mars. We've just, you know, just destroyed the Earth. And so we really need to go to another planet. And I look like, are you serious? So Brian May was there, you know, from Queen. Um, he started the astrophysics um, festival. It's called Starmus, Star Music. And, um, and Brian Eno was there. I don't know if you remember about Brian Eno. He was um, Roxy Music. Really cool dude. He and I have the same birthday. So he, he says, so with all due respect, why don't we clean up the mess we made on the earth first? <laughs> and so he just became my hero. Brian Eno, I love you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I don't regret the I or, or I, th I still think it's great to invest in reaching for the stars. How about just equal amount? I mean, right now we put gazillions of dollars in going in this direction and pennies in going in this direction to understand and care for our home planet. I, I mean, I'd be cool to set up housekeeping on Mars, but not for 8 billion people, let yeah. alone 10. I mean, it, maybe 10 people could make it on maybe Mars. 10 <laughs> people, but not 10 million. <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm too earthbound or waterbound. I just, yeah. I need the colors. You know, I just, I, I like blues and greens and, and I just, I love color. I don't know about Mars. It makes red, <laughs> brown. <laughs> so, well, we've got a few questions um, that have come in. So maybe we can jump over to questions and, um, if you want to raise a hand, we could we may have time to do that as well. But let's pop into these here. And uh, Jeanne is asking, rather than recycling plastic, should I actually try to burn it? Um, I can't always avoid them. Yeah, I can't always avoid using them, unfortunately. So what's your thought? I mean, when you burn it, you're still releasing toxins into the air. That's um, true. I yeah. mean, some, some countries do. Um, you know, uh, the, the incineration method and and certainly at sea, oftentimes ships will incinerate plastic as a way to to create some additional energy uh, sources on board. But uh, unless they're unless the byproduct of the, the smokestack has a very aggressive uh, filtration system on it, then, yeah, you are certainly releasing some um, An oil spill into the sky, oil spill into the sky. So, uh, you know, I think I think really the, the best bet is to, if you are going to use a plastic, then it needs to be one that is going to be with you for a very long time. If you're going to take care of it and it'll be enduring, it'll be that piece of Tupperware. It'll be intergenerational intergenerational Tupperware. Tupperware. <laughs> I have I have stacks and stacks and stacks of takeout containers. Yeah, and when I, I stopped great. using pallets. I'm using the takeout containers now for my paints because you know I I, I what am I going to do with them? Yeah, but it, it is actually a, work. The adaptive reuse. Yeah method but mm -hmm. but you know we really do need to continue pushing for i think for really um, aggressive recycling and and to the manufacturers if they're going to use a plastic product from the onset it needs to be a selection that can be easily or right. most easily recycled you know to your earlier point we can try to avoid as much as as possible reuse when you can right we need to collectively individually and collectively really use our voices to say enough already. You know, we, we've got, we know how to live without them because throughout most of our history, they didn't exist. How is it that we become so dependent on them? I mean, the choices that we make, I, I know it's really hard. You go into a grocery store and everything is packaged in plastic. Even you see bananas. Oh my God! When they're wrapped in plastic, you're like wrapped what? in plastic, <laughs> oranges. <laughs> they're already pretty well wrapped. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, you go to Whole Foods because you think that Whole Foods is supposed to be, you know, better, organic, and everything. Everything is wrapped in plastic, and so mm -hmm. I, I'll use like I'll get one bag and I'll put all my vegetables in there, and when I go to pay, they have to take everything out to scan them, uh -huh. but but they understand. They do yeah. understand. The young kids understand. Yeah. Like, like you with your, your neighbors in your neighborhood. Yeah. Change your voice. Yeah. Everyone, yeah. If, if people will, through their buying power and through their voice, we can change. 
I think that plastics, synthetic materials are here to stay in one way or another, but it's the responsible use and disposal of them it will make a world of difference. We've gotten ourselves into this fix, as you point out. Hand by hand. hand. Hand by hand. <laughs> let's work with, yeah, yeah, let's, let's yeah. use these hands to, to fix the problem. And make a point of it. Mm. If we just keep going with the flow, we will be, we'll continue to be inundated by this, this approach. Yeah, absolutely. Find alternatives. It will, and, and people are working on this. We're not, you're not alone, Jeannie, you who raised the question, what do you do? But you can do something individually that will help turn things around. It's going to take more than just one. It's one plus one plus one plus one plus an avalanche of people. All using, leading by example. Yeah, using your power. Yeah. It, it, can, will, it must change. So you got a few more questions. Okay, to get sorry. Through. That's all right. We have, <laughs> we have time. Yeah. So Brenda's asking, how do you choose what area to focus on and represent in your art? There's so many issues that you can address. You know, that's a great question. Um, thank you for asking that. Um, how do I choose? It sort of chooses me. <laughs> it's interesting. It unfolds. Something, something comes along and I have an idea. It can be from poetry. It can be from experience. Um, going to Raja Ampat, being that artist on board, that was a seminal moment for me. Um, being surrounded by all of these people who care so much about the oceans, about nature, about our lives. And they're all professional people. They were, uh, you know, National Geographic photographers, people who um, are also getting that message out there. So I feel like since I know about it, I have to do something. I can't just turn my back to it. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I have to do something that's meaningful. And if I can make my tiny little part of my world a better place for me having been here, then I've accomplished something. Yeah. I think that's what it is. You know, we're a part of this mm. great flow of, of life. We, I've been benefiting from those who've gone before and and if we do it right, we'll benefit those who follow us. Absolutely. It's a continuum. By the way, and I, I just one more um, thing for this question. Um, the next show that my gallery is going to be um, hosting is called I Am Ocean. Huh. And it's a group show. And um, we will, of course, be including Paul Nicklin and Christina Mittermeier, friends okay. of all of ours, yep. who are um, crusaders when it comes to the oceans and the Arctic and, um, okay. you know, all, all good things for our environment. Um, we are going to have um, another photographer who who um, photographs underwater nudes, and they're really they're just gorgeous because you know we are water. I mean, we, yeah. we are water. We were born in water, and so um, I collect his works. He's a British photographer who lives in the south of France. Uh, my work is going to be in the show. Um, so so and we we have a few more. Um, we have a couple of of. Um, well-known people. We're working on getting them into the show now. And once we do, we'll make the announcement. But um, mm -hmm. again, I am ocean. We all are. That's true. Most people don't realize it. It's, it is just true. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Our next question, is the beach area recovered from that explosion? And the answer to that is absolutely not. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing um, disaster that's just really starting to be felt at this moment. Um, it's really just been going on since May 20th when the vessel uh, first started to smolder to um, just, you know, the last couple of days when it's actually in the process of sinking. And they believe that there uh, will be now, in addition to the nurdles and the nitric acid mm -hmm. and the other hazardous waste on board, that there will now probably be uh, the fuel oil um, and bunker fuel it just gets worse leaking mm -hmm. from it um, in addition to whatever it impacts when it hits the bottom it's a disaster in progress yes it's an ongoing disaster in progress so i encourage everybody to you know keep eyes on that and again to share that story so that people understand like this is the real cost of 
making new plastic. <laughs> There's right. disasters like this. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say my recycling guy. Yeah. <laughs> Tell him. Make virgin plastic. Yeah. He makes those nurdles. Well, tell him quit shipping him overseas. And <laughs> yeah, well, we're gonna have a, we're gonna have a heart to heart. Heart to heart, exactly. It's all fossil material. It just compounds <clears throat> the tragedy. Yeah. All right. So, um, have fishing processes mm -hmm. become any more user friendly to the fish or marine life? She's gonna choke on her water now. <laughs> <laughs> all contraire. Oh, contraire, exactly. Yeah. So. We've gotten increasingly effective finding, catching, marketing, and consuming ocean wildlife. I mean, I'm a witness mm -hmm. from the scaling up of the extraction of wildlife. As one kind of creature is diminished, we found deeper places, places further removed from coastal regions like Antarctica. And no one had even seen the continent of Antarctica until 200 years ago. And as soon as the Antarctic Ocean and the continent became accessible, we began to methodically, one after another, a kind of creature from seals to birds to whales and now fish and krill. I mean, you, you diminish one to a point where it's no longer commercially profitable or because people begin to see creatures with new eyes, new affection, like whales. But fish are, in, if anything, they're, 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 they're being extracted using new methods that are better at finding them, using sonar and other techniques developed for wartime, <laughs> finding submarines and other things, and, and for scientific mapping and such. We've gotten really good at finding things in the ocean, including fish, yeah. and getting further and further offshore. I mean, until motorized vessels got really good at traveling far distances and weather reports that made it safer and safer to go further and further offshore to find, and then sonar to see where they are underwater. And then before re refrigeration, or new means of transport so that on an aircraft, a fish can be caught off Boston in the same day, virtually within 24 hours, be in a, in a market across the other side of the world. Talk about so, a carbon footprint. Yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. Right. So in new materials, new methods of, I mean, they're now nets that are so large, they're, they're the, the <laughs> the symbol, the example just used, you, you line up like a dozen 747 aircraft or the newer Dreamliners, you know, put them up in a row. The, the, the big mouth of a, of a trawler scraping the ocean floor, capturing whatever is in its path is that large, you know, the, the width of that many aircraft. large aircraft. And it's a wonder that there are any fish left in the ocean when you consider how aggressively we have tried to find them, catch them, kill them, market them. And then that's not to say that some people in some communities and some island countries and coastal areas in particular have a long history of being reliant on the ocean, ocean wildlife as a source of food. That's not what is killing the ocean. It's the it's the marketing to distant places, using fish as money, luxury dining, people eating fish that maybe historically have never eaten fish before, let alone exotic creatures taken from the deep sea in Antarctic waters. Orange roughy and, and Chilean sea bass, so-called. That's crazy. But we, we've just been blind to the impact that we're having with the fact that the ocean is limited in what it can continue to yield or the damage to the nature of the chemistry of the planet by taking so much from so many places and destroying ecosystems. We, we can see it on the land, the consequences of clear cutting or burning a forest. 
and we worry about the consequences to planetary chemistry and food for people who are displaced because you've destroyed large ecosystems. We just haven't really taken to heart the impact that we're having by clear cutting the ocean. Yeah, it's out of sight and out of mind. What about those long lines? The and the yeah, they're terrible. Yeah, they so. keep killing. Yeah. It, 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 it thousands of kilometers of long lines with baited hooks every few feet is one problem, but when they're discarded and lost at sea, they keep more killing. plastic. That's another whole level of destruction because they don't go away. They just keep killing. Okay, we've got a question from Jenny here. Let's hear some good news. <laughs> <laughs> All right, two more questions. Uh, Jenny, uh, I often hear the question about which one thing would actually have the most impact on saving the ocean planet. Looking at what we know so far, wouldn't it be correct to say that the best choice would be to stop eating commercially caught sea creatures? This one thing just seems to tackle so many problems at once, a comprehensive solution to many issues out there, including plastics, as we were just talking about. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the, for me, one of the one big things would be to get immediate and enduring protection for all of the high seas, uh, because that's where a lot of this this major extraction is going on. It's kind of like the you know the wild west out there. Uh, countries just a well, handful of countries not based on need. Yeah, not it's based, based on, on need. Choice and subsidies, and <clears throat> I, I'd love to hear what you think <clears throat> when I get asked that question. I say, look. You can sort of put it in two categories of what's wrong with the ocean issues, at least. It's what we're putting in, all this junk, all the toxins, even the carbon dioxide that goes into the ocean from burning fossil fuels, that it is not only warming the planet from consequences to the atmosphere, but it's causing the ocean to become more acidic. What we're taking out of the ocean, this large scale extraction of wildlife, and minerals, oil, gas, the things that we're extracting, two big categories. But the worst thing of all, something we can fix, and that's ignorance. It's lack of knowing that leads to the lack of caring, complacency. If you don't know, you can't care. You can't unleash your mighty superpowers of doing something if you don't know there's a problem. And there's so many people who have no idea that the ocean is in trouble or why it matters. I'm encouraged because I see more and more there is this awareness growing. And I see more and more, especially kids, but everyone asking questions. What can I do? <laughs> What's the one thing I can do? Well, the one thing is first recognize there's, there are problems out there that are affecting you, that are affecting everyone. Our future is at risk. Your kids are at risk because of not knowing we've got problems. And then, okay, so then what is it that you, I, you, Erica, you're using art. You're using the power that you have to make a difference. I mean, imagine if everyone said, oh, we've got these problems. I'm going to take this power that I have, and do something to help make a difference. And I can't tell others what that one thing might be, but we you all can, have one thing, at least one thing. Yeah. Eric, Eric what about you? You know, I, I always tell people, they're like, well, you're an artist and, you know, I'm an accountant or I'm, I'm something. And it's like everyone has it within them. Everyone has some kind of artistic expression within their hearts, their minds, their souls. And it doesn't have to be what I do or what you do. It can be anything that, that makes them feel vital and alive. And the way to feel vital is to do something vital, not just <laughs> exist, not just wake up in the morning, you know, brush your teeth, go to the bathroom, eat, etc. but to do something that has meaning to you not just survival, we're beyond that. Okay, our ancestors from tens of thousands of years ago, they were surviving, but even they 
found something when you look at the cave paintings. They found a way of expressing themselves. And so mm -hmm. if everyone finds that, that artist within them, whatever it may be, they can sing, they can write, they can, they can ride a bicycle, they can be an athlete, they can be a gardener, they can plant flowers, seeds, something, anything. Um, I think that human beings are so capable. If, if, like we said, if we can send a man to the moon, there isn't anything we can't do. And we are at the top of the food chain. Look at us. I mean, we're the ones eating everything around us. <laughs> and we're, we're, you know, whether, whether it's, it's killing those poor sharks for their fins or, and throwing them back into the water or, or, um, stealing families, the fish out of the oceans, um, or, or not just the oceans, but the factory farms, mm -hmm. what, what, what we are allowing to happen to cows and pigs and lambs and everything else. And it just, it, I remember the first time I saw a PETA film about a factory farm. That was the day I stopped eating meat. I couldn't do it anymore. And I said, okay, I'm going to be a pescatarian. I can eat fish. Well, now I can't even do that. However, when I feel the healthiest is when I eat vegetables, to be honest with you, and fruits. It's when I feel the best because I can't drink alcohol. I can't drink anything with caffeine. My body doesn't metabolize it. There's something, I don't know what's wrong with me. I, I um, but, but the one thing that I do know is what makes me feel good is healthy food that isn't hurting a live being. And somebody is like, well, aren't vegetables, you know, live? Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, how far do you go? Right. Um, and, and so as far as eating fish, I've been eating sardines and I've been eating things like that, trying not to, um, eat the other fish, but you're right. You're right. I'm a hypocrite. If I do that. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. And I think many of us are hypocrites in one way or another. I think we all are in some way. And I have to look at myself and go, Hey, if I'm going to talk the talk, I have to walk the talk. Yeah. And yep. if I don't I think do that, then I'm a hypocrite. And so here we are. Um, yeah. So it doesn't have to be all change all at once, but just making incremental change. Well, the and, sooner the better. The sooner the better. Next yeah, 10 years. Very true. Okay. Yeah, it's, 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 one more you know, we can do it. We can do anything. Because yeah, human beings are magical. Our, to get to a better place for sure. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is going to be our last question uh, from Janice. <laughs> what about the medical industry items that are being used during this pandemic? Mm. Could you make some art from the masks, the needles, et cetera? Whoa, there's a challenge. That is a challenge. You know, I was in the hospital two months ago with COVID. Oh, dear. You I were? COVID. Yeah. Oh, my yeah, goodness. everyone, we all got it. I don't know how it happened. And um, so I have recovered. As a matter of fact, I was so excited that uh, a few weeks ago we were down in Florida um, and uh, I swam. I started swimming because when I was in the hospital, I um, all I could think of was, I want to put my feet in the water. Huh. I want to be in the Caribbean. I want to be in a swimming pool. I want to swim. And um, three weeks ago, I was able to do that. I started with 10 laps, 20, 30, 50, and I finally um, got to swimming half a mile. Now, going back to, yes, that was, that was um, the day, it was on my birthday too. Nice. Uh, it was on my birthday and that's all I wanted to do on my birthday was swim and um, going back to the pandemic and the masks and all the needles and everything yes I could do something with that I I think I just wanted to not think about it to be honest with you and recover from it and I feel very recovered right now um, I, I, I um, just went to my pulmonologist. I never had a pulmonologist before. This is new. He was from the hospital. I didn't know what a pulmonologist was. <laughs> and, um, and he said that um, I can breathe just fine. 
And uh, I said, yeah, yeah, I went swimming. And he's like, good, you're, 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 you're golden. But um, every time I turn around, I see a mask on the street. I, yeah. I see it everywhere. And yes, um, they can be picked up. They need to be picked up and something needs to be done with them. Um, but what needs to be done is stop getting sick. Try to be as healthy as you can. Um, do, do, I know that sounds crazy to say that, but I think, um, for me, I think one of the reasons that I had it worse than anyone else was because I'm, I'm type A, so I don't sleep. I was sleeping like three hours a night and I was, um, stressed because I had so many projects I was doing at one time and I don't know. It's, it's, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know. Some people it affects worse than others, but, but I, I think that, um, you know, I, I recovered quickly. I mean, it was, it was, you know, some people have it longer, but it's because a lot of them don't take care of themselves. Yeah. Um, whether they're drinking too much alcohol, they're smoking, they're doing something. Um, our bodies are, you know, our temples and we have to think about our health along with the health of everything else that's living on this yeah. planet. Our oceans, our land, our rainforests. My God, it doesn't end. <laughs> I'm, I'm waiting. For, I'm waiting for someone to, you know, with all the cloth masks that people have been accumulating. I'm, I'm sure that in due course we're going to have a, you know, a COVID, COVID quilting uh, yeah. going on. You know, <laughs> they put, them, put them in like a big, big pot and boil them. <laughs> You know, make sure they're there. Yeah, you know, they're right. masks and they're masks. I mean, right. they certainly are masks that can be reused. Yes. And in theory, the masks, most of these paper ones, it, unless they again have elements of plastic, plastic, and many of them actually do, of course. Mm -hmm. It's it's a continuation of the same problem to think differently about the use of materials that infuse our lives. And in this emergency, we, we turn to what worked for that occasion. And the masks just came into existence. There, there were masks before, but the volume that were created just like boom overnight right. because of the demand, the need, the market. I think we're not particularly well thought through in terms of addressing the need in in concert with the reality of how we have to begin to live our lives if we're going to get from where we are to a better place. I think the one, the most positive thing to come out of 2020 is the recognition that not only can we change, but that we must, that we can change quickly, and we must. Going back to 2019, if you could suggest that people could just all at once stop doing some of the things that had become just every day, like flying, <laughs> like... <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like gathering in small groups and or, or in a stadium yeah. without being concerned about health issues uh, just so many things that boom we changed and why because our lives were threatened our existence was on the line we had to change and if only that awareness, we, we, we did it, we, we turned. What, what might have taken decades to achieve, we did in months, weeks and months. So with climate, it threatens our existence. With the creation of the toxic world, it threatens our existence. It's being aware that our lives are on the line and that we can change when we know that our existence is threatened. That's what will make the next 10 years potentially this turning point. I don't know that we could reach that level of change without the two by four that <laughs> smacked us over the four. the four in 2020. Okay. Yeah. Not only that we have this problem, 
the laws of nature that we can't really change, that we're susceptible to forces beyond <clears throat> our individual choices, but that collectively we can change our behavior when we have to. We have to change our behavior if we're going to address climate change, if we're going to address biodiversity loss, if we're going to address restoring health to the planet so that we can re restore health to human civilization. It's that hopeful awareness that we can do this when we know we have to. And the kids are right there as witnesses. They're not gonna let the grown-ups get away with continuing decline of the planet that is theirs to live in, in the, in the, the yeah. decades to come. Absolutely. So I think that's the best note to end on. I do. And we are kind of uh, past the top of the hour. <laughs> but we had some great questions and, and thank you. a wonderful conversation. So thank you so much, Erica. Your reason for hope. Absolutely. Oh, and God. Thank you, Liz, Sylvia. I can't thank you both enough for having me on your show and having this conversation. Um, I look forward to continuing it. I really do. I think that like you said, Sylvia, we, we do have to change and, and we do, we, we, we are forced to change at this point. And it should like, be, it's an adventure and we can do it. Yeah, yeah. Let's do it. The world. <laughs> let's do it and have well, it. I think so. I think we're, we're working on that. So thank you, both. thank you. And before we go close out today, Sylvia and I would want to say thank you to all of our guests and our producer, Ocean Elders, and everyone in the community who continues to show up and participate in these conversations. Now, dive in feels like home to us, and we hope that it feels like home to you too. Uh, water really does connect us all, and we're incredibly grateful to everyone. Um, we are going to actually be back a little off uh, cycle. We're going to come back on June 17th. And we'll be talking with the Honorable Bernadette Jordan, Minister of Fisheries, Oceans, and the Canadian Coast Guard. And mm. so that should be a really wonderful conversation. She has superpowers. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and until then, until then, <laughs> let's all say that we're going to remember to take care of the ocean. As if our lives depend on it because they do. Hmm. They do. <laughs> they do. Thanks again, everyone. We'll see you. See you next time. Okay. Bye for Bye now. Bye-bye. Thank you again to all of you. Thank you. Yeah.